Hey everybody, I am super excited to have Renuka with me today from Clockwork. She is building this really fascinating, essentially like robot that paints your nails and really bringing the world of the future to today um, and into different uh, retail environments and creating kind of this unique user experience. And so I'm really excited to learn more about what she's doing and the business opportunity and the investment opportunity that, that it represents. So Renuka, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Excited to talk. As my audience knows, the first thing that I love jumping into is just understanding the story. And so I would love to hear your story, how you came up with this idea and kind of what brought you to this point. Yeah, absolutely. So my background is in engineering, uh, concretely operating systems and AI. So it is pretty uh, out there that I got into the beauty space, but really it started with a pain point that I had for many, many years. I used to complain about how when you're busy, you know, you might, I'm a mom, I have a toddler, uh, a demanding career. So the first thing that gets deprioritized is beauty services services. And uh, all the while, you know how it makes you feel. It makes you feel confident and put together and, and happier at the end of the day. Um, and that's sort of uh, what we realized, my co-founder and I, uh, that we could bring with robots. Because right now, the market is so labor intensive, it doesn't quite make sense for them to provide a service that's like in and out. It's just not worth their time. Um, so it's I like to make the comparison with uh, food like right now the options we have are you only have five course meals and what we'd like to bring is the fast casual experience and that can be done with robots very cool very cool can you talk a little bit more about that pain point that you're helping solve for for your customer like what is it that that customers really want that they're not getting that you're really helping solve for Absolutely. And maybe that's more than just the person receiving the actual service too. Like, like I know there's like a retail component of this too. So I'd love to understand that piece as well. Absolutely. So I think um, there's, I would say there's two questions um, that you're asking really. Uh, the first is what is it doing for the end user? And the second is why does our go-to-market make sense? So uh, I'll sort of take them in that order. So Again, with the end customer, right? I was that target customer. I felt the pain. Um, and these are all the people who say or feel beauty is work. Um, this is, you know, we've been made to see all of these movies like Legally Blonde and stuff where it's like, oh, your manicurist is your best friend. And that's really not reality, right? Um, in, in reality, we are just sort of trying to squeeze that service in when you have a busy weekend, right? Like, when can I get, oh, should I get my hair colored versus my nails done? Um, and when we started interviewing customers, what we found was uh, a lot of people I have this quote that like really stayed with me. She said, this is the cost of doing business. I have to go to work looking a certain way. And that means I have to spend those hours on the weekend. That means I have to find the childcare, the parking, you know, whatever number of hours it takes. And that's when it really started to hit me that, yeah, there is a pretty big segment of people out there that are either just deprioritizing it, not doing it at all or really struggling to make it happen. Um, so that's sort of where, um, what I would say is the answer to the first part. The second part is, okay, so we have this robot, um, we decided to build a commercial robot because uh, I can get into the technology and, and why I think that's, that's the right uh, way to go. But what we realized is we have this opportunity that got even more intense with COVID where brick and mortar really wants people to come back into their spaces, whether it is offices bringing people back to work, whether it is retail stores, uh, because they realize how important brick and mortar strategy is, whether it's airports who are trying to make um, revenue out of every last square foot that they have. Um, and each of these, um, what we call hosts or partners, um, we bring value to. And so we realized that there was this great opportunity to 
be where people are already spending their time. And that brings this very different level of convenience to the end customer. And we can do that while solving a problem for the retailer. Yeah, I love that. It, it's interesting. It reminds me, you know, pre-COVID, everybody was like, got to get online, got to get online, right? And there's this huge like shift from retail to online. And then post-COVID, a lot of the companies that we've backed or that, you know, we've met with, that do consumer uh, products online have all of a sudden started shifting more back into retail, right? And, and onto other marketplaces and so forth. Because I think what happened is so much money started flowing into the advertising buckets of like get Google and Facebook and it just increased, they just increased the price of those ads. And now it's, it's almost unsustainable to only sell online and you need to find new ways of attracting customers, which has driven a lot of people back to retail. So yeah, I can definitely. And definitely even for things. the end user, right? That experience makes a lot of sense. It's so different when you're like touching and feeling materials or being advised by somebody in the store. Um, you know, there's, there's, I really want a world where uh, these two worlds just combine, right? Wouldn't it be amazing if we stepped into this like immersive pod, which like looked at your skin tone and your color preferences and your age, and uh, it recommended both services as well as products. And, you know, while you got your service done, this thing goes and shops for you and, and brings it to you either in person or, or ships it to your house. I, I really think that we're entering that, that era uh, where this is very, very possible in our lifetimes. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, tell us about the product. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our first product is a robot that paints nails and it does it faster and more precisely than most humans. It does it in about 10 minutes. Today, we charge about $10 for it, uh, for the basic service. Uh, we do have plans to add on um, services like gel and designs, which will cost a little bit more. But uh, if you look out there, this is about half the price of um an average manicure out there today like how does it how does it work it's actually really hard to get a product like this to work uh because one you're dealing with nail polish which is a non-newtonian fluid which means its viscosity literally changes based on how quickly you're pushing it out of a nozzle um, we have to deal with humans uh, this may be the first time a robot has touched an untrained human physically touched, right? Uh, and so we have to deal with, you know, user experience, people make sudden moves, they get excited and pull out their phones. Uh, you're dealing with a fluid that evaporates really quickly. So in order to create a smooth coat, you have to work quickly with it. Um, and so it, it creates all of these really, really interesting technical challenges. We've had to build our own AI, our own um, labeling tools even, because everything out there was built for self-driving cars. And so it wasn't actually built for working at sub-millimeter accuracy. But concretely, how it works is you put your hand in. Uh, we have two really powerful 3D cameras uh, taking 100 images really quickly uh, and building a very um, high resolution point cloud. The point cloud gets sent to our proprietary AI. The AI figures out where it's going to paint. That goes to a set of algorithms that decide what speed to go over um, the surface, um, you know, how, at what distance from the surface, uh, and and basically paint the nail almost like icing a cupcake. Wow, <laughs> that's fascinating. <laughs> do you use camera technology or do you use LiDAR technology? Uh, so we use what's called structured light cameras. Um, so they basically take uh, images with, and, and there's a projector and, and something that sort of sees how the light patterns plays. And mm -hmm. based on that, um, decides what the, um, what the heights of various points are. Very cool. Very cool. Talk to us about like the business model. How, how do you, how do you make money? So you mentioned it's, it's a $10 service, which is roughly half the price, but yeah, walk us through the business model. Yeah, so we partner with uh, either corporate uh, um, offices or retailers or, you know, in airports, even spas, salons, gyms, uh, anyone who really understands that this is going to bring convenience and delight to their existing customers 
uh, or bring new customers in. And so they pay us an upfront fee, a monthly fee, and a percentage of revenue. Uh, and those levers are sort of in our control. So in situations where, you know, we we expect really high foot traffic, we like to take more of the revenue, uh, we lower the, the monthly fees. Uh, in certain situations, like, for example, with partners who have nail technicians uh, and are looking for this to be sort of auxiliary or a complementary service. Uh, in those cases, it makes more sense for it to be purely B2B. Um, and and so we, we sort of have some flexibility with that model. Well, thank you so much, Renuka. This has been a real pleasure uh, to learn more about your business and what you're building. And it's really, truly inspiring and exciting. So thank you. Thank you so much. It was really fun being talking to you on this show. All right, time for another wrap up. Get my thoughts on the things that I like, the merits of the deal, and then some of the risks you need to be aware of. Now, of course, like always, this is not investment advice. It should not be construed as such. If you decide to invest, you do so at your own risk. You should do your own due diligence. But hopefully, this is some helpful guidance on things that I'm thinking about when I'm trying to decide if I want to invest in a company like Clockwork. Let's jump in. Renuka is amazing, is she not? She has so much energy, so much knowledge. She has great experience that she brings to the table here that I think is truly unique. Having worked at you know hardware companies like NVIDIA doing chip manufacturing, uh, having experience at Dropbox with like true software infrastructure, like she is the full package. When you also consider the fact that she also personally felt this pain point, right? She's a woman, like she gets her nails done. And I think like one of the things that I think is really cool is that there are not a lot of people out there that have the technical chops as well as understand kind of the pain point that millions of women face when they go to get their nails done. And yet they're trying to also balance very busy lives, uh, fixed incomes, like different budget constraints. And I think Clockwork really solves a lot of those issues. And she's someone that can truly empathize with her target and customer. Team is awesome. She's awesome. I love the, the fact that she's also built some incredible people around her. I love the fact that her and her co-founder have been working together for years. That's super important because one of the things that kills a lot of businesses is co-founders that don't get along and when they don't get along in their heads, but right, like it can implode a business. And, but when you've worked with somebody for a number of years, you've probably gone through like some good times and some bad times and have figured out how to resolve some of those issues. So love that. Bridging on the, off of that, like I also love like her investor base. So the person leading this round is one of the former founders of Dropbox. And the fact that he has so much confidence in her having worked with her, that he's willing to back her, I think is like a huge stamp of approval and, and a definite merit for this deal. Also, having initialized as one of her investors is awesome. They are a great early, early venture fund. They back some really great companies like Coinbase, Instacart, Reddit, and a whole bunch of others. They have a great track record. They're a really great fund to have landed as investors in the company because they bring a wealth of experience, connections, and credibility to what she's doing. So that's awesome. I also love the traction that she has. So she's she's already served 18,000 people or customers, uh, which I think is fantastic. So like clearly like this business works, like the product works. It's not like pipe dreams. So that's awesome. She's done pilots from with some very large companies. And then the fact that she has $1.9 million in contracted uh, ARR, I think is also like really impressive and compelling. So you're getting into a business where as an investor, like they already have real traction. They already have signed contracts. Like this, again, is not like a pipe dream in terms of not only the product, but also convincing people to buy it. Bridging off of that, I really like the business model here. So rather than sell a, a cheaper, dumbed down version of the product that probably would break, not provide a super rich consumer experience, they're going high end. But by going high end, what they're doing is they're making it a B2B sale. And that does a few things for you. So as you sell B2B, especially to large enterprises, like some of the customers that she mentioned, you're able to reduce like the churn rate of your customers, right? So people that buy it and then like they use it for a little bit and then they don't have a great experience. And so they churn off. When you deal with larger companies, they're less likely to do that. They're also harder to land as customers. So you have to keep that in mind too. Uh, and that like the customer acquisition cost is probably going to be a lot higher for a large corporation than it would be for an individual. But, you know, as I think about it, like if they were to sell to consumers at this point, 
and get the price point down to something that consumers could afford, the experience probably wouldn't be very good. It would probably break down. There would probably be a bunch of issues today. Now, over time, can they get there? Probably, right? Like over time, you you, you learn a lot about how to manufacture this thing cheaper and so forth. And, you know, maybe in like three to five years, they launch with a consumer version. That could be super interesting. But today by selling into corporate, uh, it does a lot for them. It gives them credibility. It reduces the churn. It gives them recurring revenue. It gives them large contracts. So yeah, it might cost you a bunch to land that customer. But the benefit is that once you've landed them, they probably don't leave. And they probably, you know, these devices will be put into high volume areas. So they'll get a lot of additional business and revenue from that. I also love that she's figured out how to solve problems for two distinct customer groups. Right. So buildings, retail environments, they want to find ways to pull customers in, keep them engaged. They want to, you know, in the, the case of smaller like salons, they want to provide a lower tier product that's a little more scalable. So it makes a ton of sense why retail environments and also nail salons would would buy this product and use it. Also makes a ton of sense why consumers would use it, right? You go in 10 minutes, $10, boom, you've got all 10 nails done. I think that's a, from from what I can tell, and I'm not a woman and I don't paint my nails on a regular basis. I, I don't know for sure if that's super compelling, but it seems compelling when I talk to uh, to other people I know, men and women that do paint their nails. So feels like they're, they're checking a lot of boxes there. Also, you know, I'm impressed that they're able to get like 65% gross margins and that they have this recurring revenue component of the business. When you generate revenue that's recurring versus a one-time sale like that bottle of polish, that revenue is gonna be more highly valued by investors because it's more predictable and allows you to do better forecasting going forward. Also gives you, you know, this ability because you're able to forecast better, you're able to plan the rest of your supply chain, the rest of your marketing activities, a whole bunch of other things start to become more efficient. And that's why, you know, recurring revenue tends to be more valuable than just one-time uh, revenue. All right, so let's talk about some of the risks you need to be aware of. I would say like top of my list on this uh, is that hardware is hard. You know, that's that's a common saying in our industry, hardware is hard. And that's why a lot of investors like shy away from it. Now our fund, we've done a decent amount of hardware over the years. So, you know, although I wouldn't say it's like my favorite, uh, I am kind of like an electronics nerd. And so I, you know, I love like gadgets and so forth. And so I always get intrigued by this sort of stuff. I think, you know, there are plenty of examples where hardware is done well and done right and can be very successful. And so all those things are true, but what's also true is that hardware is hard, right? You've got every time she wants to open up a new customer, right? Location, she's got to build one of these things. She's got to ship it there. She's got to get it all set up. Up. It's got to run well. If, if anything breaks, right, and things in the physical world break, you got to send somebody there to fix it. You can't have somebody remotely, most likely in most cases, like just fix it by computer through some coding like you could with software. Also, you've got to tie up a lot of working capital, which brings me to like another issue uh, that you should be aware of. And that is like, she's going to need a lot of money over time. Now, not just equity, like what she's raising in this round, but she's also going to have to get debt financing for these machines. That can be challenging. I mean, think about how high rates are today. Uh, think about, you know, how banks have kind of pulled back in terms of how they lend and, and to whom they lend. And so, you know, working capital really, I think, is going to be an issue here for this business, or at least a risk that you need to be comfortable with. Like she's she's gonna have to figure out like, okay, maybe it's not too bad to service the 1.9 million contracts she has, but what happens when she's like scaling up and all of a sudden she needs to deploy like a thousand robots, you know, in a month or two, right? A, a time period like that all of a sudden couldn't be tens of millions of dollars of machinery that gets, you know, tied up uh, and that needs to be financed one way or another. So. Uh, financing is is a is a risk you should be aware of. The other thing I want to talk about is the security here. So this round is being done as a safe, so a simple agreement for future equity. We, if you don't know what that is, check out some of my videos where I talk about what a safe is, pros and cons of a safe. Uh, this particular safe has a cap of thirty seven point five million dollars, which if we gave her full credit for the signed contracts, which is not actual revenue, but you know let's say, let's let's pretend that it was actual revenue or actual ARR, you're effectively paying 20x, uh, 20 times uh, current ARR, 
which I'll tell you is really expensive uh, in, t- in today's environment right now. So, you know, normally hardware companies, I mean, I mean think about it this way, even, even really good high margin SaaS businesses are trading probably closer to like 10 to 15 times at this early stage. Uh, and on the public markets have come down a tremendous amount. That said, like at this stage of company, like valuation is a little bit more art than science. And so I don't know. I don't feel like the valuation is like totally crazy either in terms of like where, you know, things will probably end up pricing out at a series A. Largely you're paying up because you're getting a really strong founder. You're getting a company with really great traction. You're also getting a company that, you know, to date has raised $8 million. They need to raise more. The the device that they're building is very capital intensive and is hard to build. And so there's an element of like, there needs to be enough equity left for the founders in order for them to be incentivized to keep building this. And yet you still need to raise a lot of money to build it. And so you have this like interesting dynamic where investors will basically bump the valuation up a little bit higher than they would normally because they want to ensure that the founders have a lot of equity and are highly incentivized will simultaneously have the capital that they need in order to build the product. Now, the advantage there, though, is that when you when when you have a product that is very hard to build, it creates kind of almost natural barriers to entry because anybody who wants to compete with her is going to have to raise a lot of money, have a really great team and do all those things, right? And and also do it at valuations that are somewhat similar. I mean, they're going to have all the same challenges, right? Except for she's already in market. She's already landed a bunch of B2B customers. She already has a bunch of people that have used the product. And so if you're trying to decide between, you know, clockwork and somebody new, you're probably going to go with somebody that has a track record, right? That's out there that, you know, their business model works. Right. And so anybody that comes up behind her is going to have to have something unique and differentiated um, that's compelling enough to convince investors that they should uh, pick their product instead. Anyways, getting back to valuation and the safe, you should also be cognizant of the fact that it's a cap. So uh, if the company ends up raising it, let's say a $25 million valuation, then your investment would convert at that $25 million valuation. But really, it'll come in at the same terms as the new investors coming in. And so you won't really get rewarded for that, for the risk of coming in now versus later, because I couldn't see any sort of discount on the safe like you might normally see on other safes. That being said, you know, if you're a retail investor, you this might be your only chance to invest in the company. So take, take it for, for what you will. Overall, I really enjoyed the conversation with her. I love the fact that she is doing hard things uh, to solve pain points for customers uh, that I think by and large kind of get ignored uh, when it comes to most businesses that get funded with venture dollars. So anyways, let me know, what did you think? Is this something that you're going to invest in? Did you invest? If not, like, why not? Tell me down in the comments. Let's continue the conversation there. Thanks.